Okay, we are gonna get started. I'm so glad I'm back. As I was telling others, I've been in Kentucky and went to the Ark Encounter. If you like that kind of thing, you should consider going there and seeing it. It's all of, of the ministry called Answers in Genesis. They believe that there actually was a flood, like it says in the Bible, amazing. And then they go into great detail with displays and uh, support information of how the ark was and the flood was, and they talk a lot about creation and all the things that go with it. So if you like that kind of thing, and if you ever get a chance to be in Kentucky, I would suggest you go there and see that. And then a second place, which is north, of where the ark is, is in Cincinnati, which is about an hour away, is the um, Creation Museum, okay? Creation Museum that's more of a focus on creation as opposed to the ark's focus is on the flood. So the ark is 510 feet long, the largest wooden structure in the United States. So it's just the them building this thing is quite the deal, quite the deal. So does someone want to pray for us and we get started? Someone volunteer to pray? Go ahead. Lord, we come before you once again with just grateful hearts. Thank you that you allowed us to gather here this morning and for uh, Kevin's <clears throat> effort in preparing for uh, the Revelation study today. Pray that we would be uh, able to come away with uh, just more understanding of what your uh, word is all about and how we are to live our lives. Okay, so last time, go ahead. I think there's a little bit of feedback, just a little bit. Yeah, I don't know how to adjust this thing. I'm looking here. I, I don't know how to adjust it. If I did. So I think what normally happens is the microphone will feed back if it gets in front of the speaker. So oh. If I'm over here, it does less, maybe? Yes. I still hear it ringing a little. Yeah. Okay, I don't know how to adjust it. Maybe the sound guy, if he was to come in, um, he would be able to do that. So I'll try not to. It seems like if I don't speak as loud, it's better. Okay. <clears throat> so last time we finished Revelation 19. And of course, Revelation 19 is such a big chapter because that's the second coming and, and uh, the beast and the false prophet and their armies are all gathered together and they come to get, you know, attack Christ. And of course, Christ, he takes them out, right? With the sword of his mouth, he just takes them out. It's like nothing. He just gets rid of them all. And so it was a major chapter. We had two weeks on that, and that was um, um, a couple weeks ago before I took a couple weeks off. So, I just want to mention this one chart here. So this chart is what I've been showing you all along. So remember, even from the beginning, I kept show, I showed you a chart that up to a point, and then I showed you another chart that showed a little more, and another chart showed you a little more. So here's um, the chart that I like because it kind of shows you the big picture, and you can see where we're at here. Of course, we. Last time we had the second coming, and now we're in the millennial kingdom. So here's the seven-year tribulation period and how it breaks down with those verses and all these major events. So we're getting up to this point right here, okay? So starting on the page of notes, it says we're talking about Jerusalem at the second coming, and the Lord will be king over the earth. And so I'm going to read from you from Zechariah 14, but I, instead of just reading the whole chapter, I'm, I'm acting on the, on the key points. I'm mentioning the key points. So 
In Zechariah 14, it says, also Christ will gather all the nations against Jerusalem and will be captured. Then Christ will fight against those nations. Then Christ comes and stands on the Mount of Olives and will be split in two, causing a large valley. Then the people of Jerusalem will flee by the valley to the east. So this is mostly mentioning stuff in Revelation 19, okay? Now moving on, it starts to talk about the millennial kingdom. In that day there will be no light, but at evening there will be light. It will come about that the living waters will flow from Jerusalem, from both east and west. In that day the Lord will be king over all the earth. Hmm. Key point. In that day, Israel's land will be changed into a plain, but Jerusalem will rise up. Okay? Specifically, the earth will be changed as they enter the millennial kingdom. In that day, people will live in Jerusalem with no curse in security. Then all the nations not killed will go up to Jerusalem and worship the Lord. Then everyone will celebrate the Feast of Booth, or, it says, will be punished by the Lord. Wow. In other words, the Lord's saying it's serious. You need to go up there and worship the Lord in Jerusalem. That's the plan for the Millennial Kingdom. Now we'll talk about it in the sense from Daniel 12. At that time, Michael, who guards Israel, will rise up and be an unequal time of distress for Israel, but everyone in Israel in the book of life will be rescued. Okay? At that time, many dead will be resurrected either to everlasting life or everlasting contempt. How long will these wonders, uh, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? That's actually in the text. I'm reading from the text. The time of distress for Israel will be three and a half years or 1260 days until Israel's shattering is completed. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination is set up, now it's on the chart there, okay? There will be 1290 days, which is 1260 days plus 30 days. Okay? And that's from Daniel 12 and Daniel 13. Blessed is he who waits and attains to the 1,335 days. Oh, a new number. 1,260 days plus 30 days plus 40 days. That's right in Daniel chapter 12, verse 12. So the 30 days plus 40 days is the time between the end of the 1260-day tribulation of Israel and the setting up of the millennial kingdom. There's this 75-day period, okay? The tribulation ends, there's 75 days, and then all of these things occur, okay? The 30 plus 45 days is probably when the sheep and the goat judgment occurs in Matthew 25, okay? The 30 and 45 days is a transitional period between the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So think of it as Revelation 19 comes to an end, then there's 75 days and these events are in there. Now remember, this helps us to understand things even like the rapture and everything. There's a huge amount of information in Revelation telling you all the details of the end time and what's going to happen and who's going to be there and all the events. Tons and tons and tons of information. But you know what? There's more information that's not in Revelation that must occur during those times. Like the Millennial Kingdom. Like all these events that I'm going to explained to you this morning. Revelation 20 covers many major events that occur over a thousand year period. The millennial kingdom, the resurrections, the judgments, and the second death. Satan is bound by an angel thrown into the abyss for a thousand years. The first resurrection, meaning of the saints, to reign with Christ for a thousand years. 
The millennial kingdom, many Old Testament passages refer to the millennium and the nation of Israel. Israel is resurrected, comes to life out of the graves. Ezekiel 37 and those other verses. Israel is gathered, judged, and brought into the bond of covenant. So right now, Israel doesn't believe, except for a remnant of Israel believes, as it says in Romans chapter 11. Israel is restored. There are so many verses about Israel being restored that I could fill up half a sheet of paper, I think, with just listing the verses. And yet, many Bible teachers say, well, you know, the terrible stuff they did, you know, they killed Christ and they didn't obey and, you know, they didn't do anything right and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to touch on that a little bit as we go. And when Jesus comes, he will take away Israel's sin and all Israel will be saved. Hmm. Romans 11. Christ builds temple, meaning Ezekiel's temple in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, it says in Zechariah 6 and Ezekiel 40. The promised land will be divided for Israel in the millennial kingdom. So you go to Ezekiel 47 and it even says, this part of the promised land was given to this tribe. This part of the promised land was given to this tribe. This part of the promised land. Hmm. Why would they ever give land divided land to Israel unless Israel is restored and given the promised land, okay? As it says in the Abrahamic covenant. The new covenant will be fulfilled for Israel. We know that because of Jeremiah 31 and many, many, many passages that talk about the new covenant applied to Israel and the new covenant belongs to Israel. We get the benefit of it, but all the covenants belong to Israel, as it says in Romans chapter 9. All the covenants and promises belong to Israel. We were never given the covenants, but we get the benefits of the covenants and the new covenant is applied to us when we are members of the church. And if you want to talk about, if you want to look up covenants, though, my last, last year I did 22 weeks on the covenant. So if you say, oh, I don't know about this covenant, um, you can go to that link I showed you there. The Abrahamic covenant will, will be fulfilled for Israel. Everything in the Abrahamic covenant will be fulfilled for Israel in Genesis 2, 13, 15, 17, 18, 22. Okay? Everything. Okay? The Abrahamic covenant is mostly about Israel and some about us Gentiles. But the main emphasis is about Abraham's physical descendants, his blood relatives. Okay? And the reason I emphasize that is because some scholars say, well, you know, it's not really, the Abraham Covenant is mostly about those, the Gentiles. And I'm like, really? That's not what it says. And so I go into great detail, if you will, I want to go there. The next page, the Davidic Covenant will be fulfilled for Israel. Oh, why is that? Well, if you read those passages there that are about the Davidic Covenant, it says there will be always be one on the throne of David. And even in Luke chapter 1, when Jesus is born, the angel tells Mary that. He will reign on the throne in Jerusalem. Okay? This one, this one, this baby being born. The next covenant, the De what I call the Deuteronomy Covenant, so many people call it the Palestinian Covenant and these other names. If you read Deuteronomy 29 and 30, you'll go, whoa, this is totally different than the Mosaic Covenant. But 
This covenant at the end of the, of the book of Deuteronomy, right before Moses dies, says all these things. It basically says everything is going to happen to Israel. It says, oh, you will sin, okay? You'll be dispersed to the nations. Oh, you'll be gathered back from the nations. Oh, I'll circumcise your heart, which is the same as applying the new covenant to him. I'll give you the new covenant applied to you and all this stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute. That was before Moses died. So it's prophetic. It's major prophetic. And it must be fulfilled. It's not a suggestion. It's a must be fulfilled. Not because I say. Because scripture says and God's reputation is at stake. Number 12, thrones for judgment are set up for all the saints, both Jew and Gentile. We'll talk more about that. <coughs> this is the first resurrection. It's just for the saints. All non-tribulation saints were raptured, resurrected previously. When we studied the rapture, um, that was all previously. Okay? All saints, both blue and Gentile, reign on thrones with Christ for a thousand years. They will be priests of God and Christ and reign with Christ. Christ reigning on throne in Jerusalem on Mount Zion in the temple, meaning Ezekiel's temple. The 12 apostles and David will be reigning on thrones with Christ, according to those verses. So there's a lot of people reigning on thrones, okay? Who are they reigning over? Wouldn't they all be on thrones? The way I understand it is just like government today, you have the people in Washington, D.C., and then you have the people over all the states, and then those people might have people under them, and so on and so forth. So the 12 disciples, maybe, I don't think it explicitly says, but let's say they're dealing with things concerning Israel, okay? More focused on that and other peoples are doing other tasks. So they're sort of like layers of government we have today would be like that. Another example of, of that is Daniel. Now Daniel was made in charge, second in charge of the whole kingdom when he was, you know, because he interpreted the prophecy of Nebuchadnezzar. And then what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? They were assigned to overrule over, over these other areas of the kingdom, you see? That doesn't mean they were the same level as Daniel, but they were doing those other ones. So it's that kind of thing where I think there will be all of these different people <clears throat> assigned to do different things. Because as we'll find out later, we're still going to work in the millennial kingdom, okay? We're still going to do tasks, okay? But there'll be no curse, but we'll be... Or, I'm not saying there's no curse. I'm saying the curse won't be the same as it is now because it'll be great peace and prosperity. But there will still... It's kind of... Another way I like to look at the Millennial Kingdom that kind of goes along with that, the Millennial Kingdom is kind of halfway between a perfect state and an unperfect state, okay? So now we're under the curse... We got all this says, Satan's loose, everything, we're getting um, infected by all of his deceptions and all the things going on in the millennial kingdom. Most, all of that is taken away, but not all. But when you get to the eternal state after the millennial kingdom is open, <coughs> over, the old earth taken away, fled away, it says in the text. New heavens, new earth, no curse, no death, no nothing. You see what I mean? How it's kind of a transitional time, millennial kingdom? But, uh, <coughs> After a thousand years, Satan will be released from the abyss to deceive and gather nations. Satan and Gog and Magog nations and their armies surround the saints in Jerusalem. Then fire from heaven consumes their armies. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire to be tormented forever. Great white throne for Christ set up, um, and the earth and heaven have fled away. Unbelievers from death and Hades are resurrected and judged for their deeds, and this is the second death. Judge believers are thrown into the lake of fire, and we're not going to quite get to that text. I'm drink a little water so I can talk. 
Someone want to read Revelation 21 through 3. <clears throat> Okay. The angel coming down from heaven holding a key of the abyss and a great chain. Then John saw the angel coming down like the angel back in Revelation 10. So there's angels coming out of heaven. This angel was holding two things. He was holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. The key of the abyss is not a metal key, but a metaphor, a figure of speech in which a word or phrase literally denoting one kind of object or idea is used to used in place of another to suggest a likeness. Okay? Key means the means for gaining access to something by their owner, as in the key to success or the key to your heart. Because some commentators go, well, you know. How could he have this big key? And they just keep picturing this big, giant, you know, 10-foot-long key, and he takes it and flies down with this big metal key and the locks things, and you're like, well, no, it's picturing that he has the access to something, not so much a metal key. Moving on, this is like the fifth trumpet angel in Revelation 9, where it says, the key of the bottomless pit was given to him, and he opened the bottomless pit. Jesus has the keys of death and Hades in Revelation 1. Keys give access to a place or thing by their owner, here a metaphor, and death is a condition, and Hades is a place, the grave, the abode of the dead. The abyss in Greek, abusos, is the bottomless pit in Revelation 9, the dwelling place where certain demon angels and their Satan are kept in prison in Revelation 20. In bonds, temporarily and internally in Jude 9, the abyss is where the angel demon of the abyss, Abaddon or Ap Apollon, comes from in Revelation 9. The abyss is where the beast, the Antichrist, comes out of to kill the two witnesses in Revelation 11, 17. The abyss is where Satan is kept or in prison, in bonds, temporarily for a thousand years until he's released to deceive the nations. So we'll go to the next page. The abyss is where God co committed them, demons, to pits of darkness reserved for judgment in 2 Peter, it says. Now, let's switch to the great chain, the second thing. The great chain is not a metal chain, but a metaphor, a figure of speech, like we just described before. The chain, something that confines, restrains, or secures. As in, my baby's got me locked up in chains. Whoa, these chains of love, just like the Beatles said. You know, I even left off a line. It says, my baby's got me locked up in chains, and they're not the kind that you can see. Okay? That's the kind of chain we're talking about here, okay? So it makes it more fun talking about the Beatles, but whatever. <laughs> So the angel laid hold of the dragon and bound him for a thousand years. Then the angel laid hold of, or seized, it says seized in ESV, the dragon, Satan. Here are the four names of him, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan. This is the great dragon thrown out of heaven with his angels. In chapter 12 for the previous three and a half years. So remember what we talked about earlier, the last three and a half years, Satan's thrown out of heaven. It says he's thrown down to the earth, okay? And man, when Satan's thrown down to the earth, he's like accelerating, because he knows he only has a short time. 
He has three and a half years to do what he's going to do to kind of overcome God's plan. And of course, he doesn't win out, but he's there doing that. That's really important that uh, he come down. So the angel laid hold of or seized and bound the dragon with a great chain. The great chain, in this case, is something that restrains or keeps under, one under control, a metaphor. The great chain that restrains is called eternal bounds when applied to demon angels in Jude 6, where it says, And the angels who did not keep their own domain abandoned their, their abode. He has kept in eternal bonds under the darkness for the judgment of the great day. Satan has freedom in the garden, in, and he also in Job, and also in the Old Testament, and also in the Gospels, and for the last 2,000 years, he's got all this freedom. But after Christ comes, he is bound and in the abyss temporarily for 1,000 years. Okay? Satan's 1,000 years is mentioned six times in Revelation Chapter 20, uh, those verses listed there. <clears throat> so I'm stopping in this box here at the bottom of the page, and I'm going to talk about non-literal interpretation that I've talked about many times before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some examples of non-literal interpretation of the thousand years and tell you why I think it's not right. So I'm quoting here. These are quotes. You can look these up if you want. I can show you where they are. So in the quote, it says, how long does the millennium last? So according to this commentary, there can be no doubt it began with the completed work of Christ on earth. What he's saying, it began at the cross. A thousand years began at the cross. 2,000 years ago. That's what this commentary is saying. Why then does Revelation use the expression of thousand years in terms of biblical numbers? Ten represents fullness, and thousand is ten times ten times ten, hence fullness times fullness times fullness. It seems to equal a vast number of years without being a precise chronology of human history. What? I don't get it. Sorry. Nowhere else does Scripture limit the binding of Satan and, and the success of the church mission to a specific period of time before the age. My comment to that is, no one says that. So he's using an argument that no one says to prove his point. That's called a straw man argument. He makes an argument that's easily pushed over. Moreover, there are other places in Scripture where the word thousand is used without being a literal number. In Psalm 50, the same number is employed in different contexts, where it says God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, where it says that... That's a hyperbole. And he even admits, well, it's not the same context of, of, of here in Revelation 20, but I'll tell you what, I'll take you back to Psalms, tell you what it means, and then because that doesn't mean something, therefore you can come back to Revelation and say, see, that doesn't mean something. You see what I'm saying? We'll see what he's doing? They're very clever about it. Also, the message in Psalm 50 and 68 is one of fullness is the same as 20. Okay? And same as Psalm 68, 17, it says, it's thousands. So, then it says, one day the fullness of the elect will be brought into the church. I, I don't know where it's talking about the church here, but... That's what he says, and then the end comes. It's not a matter of literally 1,000 years. So this commentator doesn't believe 1,000 means 1,000. But of God's secret timing as to the gathering of the people, union with Christ, however long that may take from our own human perspective. I'm like, what? Why not just read the text? Why not just say, since it mentions six times, it's 1,000. So I'm going to go into that more. There's the link if you want to verify what that says. Another commentator says, thousand years as seven mystically applies universality. Ooh, that sounds clever. Okay. So a thousand implies perfection, whether in good or evil. Thousand symbolizes that the world is perfectly leavened and pervaded by divine, since ten is 
since the thousand is ten, the number of the world, and raised to the third power, three being the number of God. Like I said before, my head starts to spin when I read these things. It starts to spin. I can't, I can't comprehend. What does a thousand have to do with a math problem? Ten to the third power. What does it have to do with anything? Okay. It's almost like numerology. Yeah, yeah, I think in some ways it's a form of numerology. You get a number and you try to get a meaning from it, you see? But you get the meaning from your head, you get the meaning from your imagination, and you apply it. The third one, the interpreting of a thousand years in these verses, that is a symbol with a definite meaning, not of a period of time, not of a period of time, but a symbol of the complete and perfect rule of Christ over the lives of fully surrendered Christians. See, it says nothing about that in there. These non-literal traditions break most rules of interpretation. They interpret out of context, add and subtract meaning that is not in Scripture, and spiritualize, symbolize, and mystical application to the plain, straightforward meaning as literally presented in the text. They open the door to be cursed by adding and subtracting from the words of the book. It says in Revelation 22, a test of anyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. I'm hearing them, okay? If anyone adds to them, God will add to them. The plagues are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book, the prophecy, God will take away his part in the tree of life. Don't anybody risk that, okay? You do not want to risk that. These three codes add and subtract meaning from what the text says. It doesn't say multiply 10 times 10, three times. More, next page. So here at the next page, I'm going to tell you how I think it should be done literally. A thousand years is interpreted literally, literally in this blue box. A thousand, there's two words in Greek for a thousand, okay? One is Jeholai nine times in those verses and also, 22 times, it's, it's Chelias, I don't even know how to pronounce it, and that's the number for it. Chelism is derived from the Greek word chelis, a thousand. So in the first couple cent centuries, everybody believed in a thousand-year millennial kingdom, or most everybody did. And then after that, when all of uh, origin and all these ones came up, they started they started um, interpreting the Bible spiritually, okay, and allegorically and all this, and then it became really popular. So that is carried through from about the 4th century through the Reformation. For the past 2,000 years, it's been being carried forward. But finally, in the late 1800s, there's these people going, wait a minute, wait a minute, this doesn't seem quite right. You're basically saying... Use your imagination to come up with an answer instead of using specifically what the text says. Okay? Chilism is teaching that Christ will reign for a little thousand years on earth after his second coming. So numbers without using an S is using a number as an adjective. You can look this up like in English grammar books, okay? This isn't like a secret thing, okay? Everybody can look this up. You can go and look it up for yourself. When you say you have $1,000, you have exactly $1,000. When you say you have $1,000, you're using 1,000 as an adjective, describing, okay? You're describing using an average as to how many dollars you have exactly. You don't have $999. You don't have $1,001, okay? To holy, a thousand occurs in those verses. And the chalice, 1,000, is used in the plural chalice, see verses above, but translated in singular everywhere except in thousands of thousands. So they're going, aha! Kevin, so what you're saying is not right because right there it has an S on the thousands. Right there in chapter 5, verse 11. That's, 
And that last part I got right from Vine's expository dictionary of the Old Testament, which is a good resource for looking up Greek stuff. So I want to comment on that. So how could you, Kevin, you broke your rule by saying a thousand there for that word with an S on it, okay? So Revelation 5 is better seen in the King James Version, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. But you notice the word times in there? I have it in gray with a line through it. That's not in the Greek. Really, the Greek text says 10,000, 10,000. It doesn't say 10,000 times 10,000. So notice there's no S's on there. And thousands of thousands. It doesn't have the word of in there either. Thousand, thousands. Okay? So when they interpret thousands, they just think, oh, well, that better explains it. But if you look in the text, it's not plural. The word thousand isn't plural in the Greek. Okay? I know you, everybody isn't an expert on the Greek, but I wanted to at least mention there is an objective way of telling. Numbers using S is using number as a noun, not an adjective, a noun with an S. When you say you have thousands of dollars, you don't know exactly how many dollars you have. Right? When you say you have thousands of dollars, you're using thousands as a noun. You're describing using a noun as to how many dollars you have approximately. You're saying approximately how many dollars you have in plural. This means you could have either 2,000, 10,000, or $100,000. So picture, you go to your bank teller and say, I want to take out thousands of dollars. And then she looks at you like, how much do you want to have taken out? You see? You're not telling how many. It's a noun. Okay? You're not telling how many. So she's going, well, how much do you want to take out? Then you have to tell her. Then you use the adjective to tell her. You see what I mean? So I'm trying to give you this brief um, understanding of Greek, and so you'll have an objective way to look at it for those who dig deep. Moving on. Then the angel threw the dragon Satan into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him. And the angel had the key to the abyss. Then he laid hold or seized of the dragon. And then he bound the dragon with a great chain. Then he shut the abyss. And then he sealed the abyss over the dragon. And of course, we talked about that um, in the previous couple pages before about the abyss. Moving down, then the angel threw the dragon Satan into the abyss so that, um, here's the reason, the dragon could not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. When he does not deceive them after these things, he must be released for a short time. So the dragon Satan, who deceives the world, when thrown down from heaven in chapter 12, the serpent has been deceiving the world since the Garden of Eden. According to 2 Corinthians, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, meaning the abyss, and will come out to deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth, verses 7 and 8. To deceive is to cause someone to believe something that's not true to gain personal advantage. Okay, we know what that is. Next page. So I'm going to read verse 4. It's only one verse, but it's kind of long, okay? okay? Verse 4 of chapter 20. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority as a judge is committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its images and had not received its mark on their forehead or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, so you notice how long verse 4 is and how much information is there. There's a lot of information there. In the Greek, it is this verse is two sentences. And I labeled them here as sentence 4a and sentence 4b. It seems that 
for a sentence could have been split into many verses. Remember, the verses themselves are not inspired. You could go to your Bible and erase every verse number in there and you're not doing anything wrong, okay? Verse numbers are like page numbers in a book. Why do you have page numbers in the book? Why not just not have them? Why, have, why just have it blank? So you can find your way to a certain point in the book. Or in this case, verses so you can find your location there and um, find a specific point. Then John saw thrones and they sat down on them. The pronoun they can't be interpreted by the previous context. So almost always, 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 like 99.9% .9 of the time, whenever you see a pronoun, right before it, it's talk, it gives like a person's name, okay? It might say like, the disciples, blah, 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 and then they, okay? Or whatever the group of people is. But for some reason, in this verse, it doesn't do that. The they here must refer to the saints who rule in the millennial kingdom, both Jew and Gentile. Daniel 7 helps us to understand that. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. Oh, that's what Daniel said. Verse 18 in Daniel chapter 7, but the saints of the highest ones will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Hmm. Verse 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one and time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So what I'm thinking is the saints are going to take possession of the kingdom. Okay? And they're going to reign on thrones. And you're like, well, I thought Christ was in charge. He is. But they're going to help reign, right? They're going to sit on his throne with him. Okay? There's many passages that talk about that, and we're going to touch on those. Book of Daniel here concerns the saints of Daniel's people or the nation of Israel. Believe, believers or saints reigning on thrones with Christ is mentioned in all those verses. And they must refer to all of those saints, both Jew and Gentile, who will rule in the millennial kingdom. I'm kind of like most people. I'm like, well, just have, just have Jesus there. It would be so much simpler. But that's not what it says. Okay? It's not what it says. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about Israel here, the restoration and resurrection of the nation of Israel. Israel's resurrection, a restoration. Israel's great sin and scattering by the wrath of God, it says in Ezekiel 36. So I'm mostly taken from Ezekiel 36 and 37 for this. Tons more places I could go to and explain it uh, in a similar way. Israel's great sin and scattering by the wrath of God in Ezekiel 36. The Lord's concern for his holy name profaned by Israel among the nations. The Lord vindicating his name, but not for Israel's sake. Not for Israel's sake, but for his sake. The Lord gathering Israel back to the land and cleansing them. The Lord giving Israel a new heart and a new spirit in Ezekiel 36. The Lord giving Israel the Holy Spirit within them to observe his ordinances. The Lord giving Israel the land of their forefathers. Israel will be the Lord's people, nor will be their God. The Lord multiplies grain, fruit, and produce for Israel. The Lord does this, but not for Israel's sake. It says it twice. The Lord cleansing Israel's sin and its cities restored. The land of Israel becomes like the Garden of Eden and rebuilt. That's all in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 37 says, The valley of dry bones, Israel coming to life out of the graves, are resurrected. The dried bones be coming alive with the breath and skin and standing on their feet, and these bones are the whole house of Israel. It says specifically that. Okay? The Lord opens Israel's graves, causes them to come out of their graves. The Lord puts the Holy Spirit in them. They come to life, and they're put on their own land. That's what it says. Next page. That's just out of those two chapters of Ezekiel. 
Furthermore, and judgment was given or granted to them, both Jew and Gentile believers, these believers will be sitting on thrones, reigning with Christ, and be granted by God to judge others and in and during the thousand-year millennial kingdom. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians helps us. Or do you not know the saints will judge the world? That's what Paul's telling, telling us. If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more judge matters of this life? Okay. So that helps us to see that one of our purposes in the future millennial kingdom is to do a certain amount of judging. Not all the judging, some of it. Okay. Moving down, then John saw the souls of those who had been beheaded or killed, it says in the verse. They were beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, uh, they were martyred saints. And those believers who had not worshipped the beast or his image and those who had not received the mark on their forehead. So when you're talking about that last part, you're talking about, well, you're talking about the seven-year tribulation period, right? You're not talking about before that. Moving down, the souls of those beheaded killed martyrs. The soul is the immaterial part of a person, the heart, mind, conscious, as in those verses. These martyrs are the tribulation saints slain or killed during the seven-year tribulation period. Like that part there, okay? They are first souls, absent from the body, but now have come to life or been resurrected because of the testimony during the seven-year tribulation. These martyrs were, are the killed tribulation saints, saints mentioned in all those verses of Revelation. <clears throat> These martyrs are not the church gathered resurrection before the seven-year tribulation. Because the rapture there includes those alive believers being caught up in Christ without being killed as martyrs. So when you read 1 Thessalonians 4 about the rapture, it, it, only, it talks about two groups of people. Those alive in Christ, being gathered up, right? Dead in Christ, out of the graves, two groups. In Revelation 20, one group. That group identified as those that come out of the seven-year tribulation. Totally different. Okay? Totally different. Reformed theology's four views believe the raptured saints and martyred angels were both caught up and rise at this point in time, but I see no one being caught up alive here. There's no mention of the rapture of both those raised dead and those caught up alive in Christ in the book of Revelation. Moving down, they, the dead, came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Then they, the dead, martyred tribulation saints, came to my life or were resurrected from the grave. All believers, when they die, their spirits go to be with the Lord, but their bodies to the grave. All believers, when they are resurrected, their new spiritual bodies are united with their spirits that are already with the Lord. Remember, that's the basic thing in 1 Corinthians 15. The dead martyred tribulations came to life, or saints came to life and began to reign with Christ for a thousand years. So the saints are overcome as a reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom, as we said before. The saints will be given authority over the nations, Revelation 2. Hmm, that's more part of reigning, isn't it? The ruling. The saints will sit down with Christ on his throne in that verse. The saints will be a kingdom and priest to God and will reign upon the earth. Oh, Revelation 5 says that too. Lots of places say that. Hmm. The saints will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Hmm. Revelation 26. Christ will reign on his throne in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. Christ reigning is mentioned in these passages now, there's a lot of passages there to read, but there's a lot of passages that I don't have listed there 
that say the same thing. Probably one of the best ones is Isaiah 2 at the bottom of the page. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem now came about in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established at the chief of mountains and be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Has that happened yet? No. Many peoples will come and say, come and go to the mountain of Zion of the Lord, to the house of, the, of God of Jacob. Next page. That he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he, the Lord, will judge between the nations. Oh, the Lord will judge. I thought before we said the saints will judge. Hmm. They both will judge, but just judging different things. And the Lord will render decisions for many peoples, and they will harp, they will hammer their swords into plow swords and spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, never again will they learn war. Hmm. So it's a time of great peace with Jesus in Jerusalem in the temple, judging the earth, and yet. As we'll see, there are still people dying and still people in their flesh. So I'm going to read verses 5 and 6 of chapter 20. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed <coughs> only is one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay. In Greek, verse 5 is two sentences labeled here as sentence 5a and sentence 5b. But Revelation 6 is just one sentence. So you see in the outline, I'll show you where those are. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. The rest of the dead, meaning all those not included in the martyred believers that we just talked about in the previous verses, did not come to life, not resurrected. These dead persons must then be seen as unbelievers. Death is a condition, Hades is a place, the grave, the boat of the dead, where unbelievers temporarily go after death until they are raised judged and condemned in chapter 20, 12 through 15. These dead unbelievers will not be raised until the thousand years is completed. So the dead believer's resurrection is on hold for a thousand years. No resurrection for them. This is the first resurrection, the one we've been talking about. This, at first glance, seems to refer back to what was said concerning the rest of the dead, the unbelieving dead, but instead it refers to believers in verse 4 and 6. With this in mind, this is the first resurrection, refers to the martyr believers in verse 4. And the blessed and holy ones that are priests of God and reign with Christ in verse 6. So, you get to some of the commentaries and they go, like reform commentaries, and they go, wow, this is the first resurrection. So, there wasn't any before, so there was no rapture before, because it's the first resurrection. It says right there, it says right there, the first resurrection. So, we need to comment on that to make sure we understand what it means. In the blue box there, the resurrection of the righteous or the resurrection of the life occurrences. Christ was the first Fruits, the first resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. We all know that he was resurrected, right? So that was the first resurrection. Then the resurrection of many bodies of dead saints. So right after the cross, right after Jesus dies, all these saints come out of the grave. That's what it says in Matthew 27 and John 5. Then caught up, resurrected of the church. That's the rapture, what I think the rapture occurs. Then the resurrection of the two witnesses, that's in Revelation 11. 
assumes they weren't resurrected before. I put that in there because I was thinking, well, the two saints are resurrected, but if they are resurrected Moses, Moses and Elijah, then they kind of have to do it twice, you know? So I wanted people to know that I didn't forget that. Then the next one is then the resurrection of the martyred dead tribulation saints. That's our verses we're reading now here in Revelation 20 and also referred to in John 5. Then the resurrection of Old Testament saints as in those verses there not mentioned in Revelation 20. So here's another example of certain things not mentioned in Revelation, but must occur <clears throat> because it was promised and prophesied. Reformed Theology View says, therefore we confidently affirm the first resurrection here is a spiritual meaning non-physical resurrection having reference to the conversion of sinners through the preaching of the gospel. What? See, I don't get it. So whenever he says use of spiritual, spiritual is kind of a, hmm, Holy Spirit kind of thing. That's kind of cool, right? Spiritual means non-material, non-physical. Angels are spirits. You can't see them. They're immaterial. They don't have physical bodies. Some people say, well, the angels appeared in the Old Testament to Abraham and all that. Yes, they converted to bodies that could be seen temporarily, but really they're spirits as God is spirit. And Jesus is spirit who became flesh and dwelt among men. We all remember that verse, right? So what they're basically saying, it wasn't a real resurrection. It was like, just like it's always been for the last 2,000 years. If you die, your spirit goes to heaven, but there's no physical resurrection in Revelation 20. Further down, blessed and holy is the one who part in the first Resurrection of believers. Over these believers, the second death has no power, but they believers will be priests of God and priests of Christ. And they will reign with him for a thousand years. The saints and overcomers will reign with Christ during the millennial kingdom, as we said before. Next page. So keeping track of who's going to be there in the millennium is kind of a big deal, okay? And a lot of questions come from that. So I'm trying to touch most of that. I'm sure I won't get everything, but who will be there? The raptured, caught up, resurrection, all who come to Christ from Pentecost, Acts 2 to Revelation 4. That's who's going to be there, okay? One group, other groups, okay? This resurrection resurrects all the dead tribulation saints who come to Christ. We just read that, right? Revelation 20. All saints, once resurrection, are glorified in the final state of honor and esteem. What remains is all the alive, not killed, tribulation saints who come to Christ. Oh, a second group. So every single believer in the seven layer tribulation isn't killed, but there's thousands, maybe even millions or whatever, that were killed. But some are killed, okay? These alive tribulation saints join all the previously resurrected saints and enter into the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom begins with the resurrected believers and alive believers only. Only two groups. No unbelievers go in the millennial kingdom. Only believers. Two types of believers. Resurrected believers in their glorified bodies enter the kingdom. Believers who haven't got the resurrected bodies, just like we are, still in the flesh, will enter the kingdom also. Two groups of believers. And without resurrected unbelievers and without al alive unbelievers... No unbelievers will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus said. Okay. 
The separating of alive believers and alive unbelievers happens at the sheep and goat judgment in Matthew 25 where all the alive nations are gathered before Christ on his throne, the sheep will inherit the kingdom and eternal life, it says, and the goats will depart to the eternal fire and eternal punishment. Right? So that's another thing that's not in the book of Revelation, but must happen because Christ talked about it in Matthew 25. It's commonly called the sheep and goat judgment. During the millennial kingdom, alive believers will have children. Some of those children will be believers and some of those children will be unbelievers. Just like today. If you have children, some may end up believers, some may not be believers. Like it is now, today, at the present age. When the thousand years is complete and Satan will deceive the nations, there will be unbelievers as the sand of the sea. Whoa! That's a lot of unbelievers. All born within the thousand year period. Remember, none coming at the beginning. But every child born may or may not be a believer. Okay? And we know that because the armies are like the sand of the sea that come to attack, and the assumption is those armies are unbelievers. During the church age, the past 2,000 years, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Once that fullness comes in, mostly Gentile church will be raptured or resurrected. During the millennial kingdom age, the future 1,000 years, all Israel will be saved. Romans 11. All Israel will be saved. And all of the Old Testament saints will be resurrected, according to those verses. Christ will be king in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, his temple, and on the throne of David. And all the nations will stream to Mount Zion, and there will be peace for a thousand years in Isaiah chapter 2 that we just read. During the middle, middle age, Israel is restored. All those verses. Talk about Israel's restoration. And the reason I keep bringing it up, because... Reformed theology says, well, no, Israel's done for. We have become Israel. We're the new Israel. Okay? So you'd have to study those verses and see where they get those, that from. But we have not become Israel. After a thousand years is completed, Satan is released, peace ends, and the war against Jerusalem. Then the present earth and heaven have fled away, in verse 11, being destroyed. Then the great white throne judgment judges all resurrected and alive believers, and they are thrown in the lake of fire. Therefore, no more unbelievers during the eternal kingdom age. The future eternity, the new heaven and earth are created. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven from the Father's house, where Jesus has prepared a dwelling place for his disciples and all believers. That's kind of getting ahead of what we read, but that's what's going to happen here in this chapter. Next page. Okay, the millennial kingdom occurs between verse 6 and 7. Do you see in your Bible that white spot there? You could take this whole document just like, and just crush it into that white spot there, the, the gap, okay, between those two verses. Because it must occur, and we are assigning it to that location. And we know it's in that location because what does the next verse say? Right? What's the next verse say? When the thousand years were completed, Satan will be released. Oh, you see where I get that in there? That's why I did it that way. When Christ returns to earth after his second coming, he's stabbing himself as king in Jerusalem on Mount Zion in his temple, sitting on the throne of David. At this time, all of the covenant promises that were given and belonged to Israel will be fulfilled. All the part of those covenant promises that hadn't been fulfilled yet. There's some of them are partially fulfilled, but not fully fulfilled until the millennial kingdom. For example, I listed them here. Abraham and covenant promised by God, by covenant, 
The Lord will make Abraham a great nation, a great name, a great blessing. The Lord will give the land of Canaan to Abraham and his physical descendants. Okay? Sometimes it's, the word is seed. Seed and physical descendants, same thing. <coughs> the Lord will give Israel all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Hmm. I haven't done that yet. Okay. The Lord through Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, we'll go to this next covenant. The Deuteronomy covenant in Deuteronomy 29 and 30 that is promised, spoken by Moses, revealed to him by the Lord about what's going to happen. Israel will return and obey the Lord with all their heart and soul. Oh, verse 7, or verse uh, 2. The Lord will restore Israel from captivity and have compassion on Israel. The Lord will gather Israel from all the peoples where the Lord has scattered Israel. The Lord will bring Israel into the land and their fathers possessed, and Israel shall possess it. The Lord will prosper Israel and multiply them more than their fathers. The Lord will circumcise their heart. That's another name for the new covenant. And the heart of the Israel's descendants. Oh, their descendants too. To love the Lord with all their heart and with all their souls so they might live. So the Lord's going to give Israel a new heart. Said way back in the time of Moses. Huh. Hundreds of years later, the time of Jeremiah. The Lord will give Israel a new heart. Oh. The book of Hebrews quotes Jeremiah 31. I will write it on your heart. I will give you a heart to know me. Okay? Millennial kingdom. New covenant applied to Israel. All Israel saved. Okay? Their hearts circumcised. They're all resurrected. Ezekiel 37. Okay? It's going to happen. The Davidic covenant has to be fulfilled. The Lord will appoint a place of land for my people Israel and plant them there. Israel will live in their own place and not be disturbed again. <coughs> the Lord will raise up David's descendants, seed, who will come forth from David. The Lord will establish David's kingdom. The Lord will establish the throne of David's kingdom forever. How long is forever? It doesn't have an end, right? Clear. It says, in another place it says everlasting, okay? The new covenant. All those verses, key verses, there's many others, but those are the key ones. New covenant promise. Days are coming in the future when the Lord will make a new covenant with Israel and Judah. All those verses. The Lord will make a new covenant, not like the Mosaic covenant. Not like the Mosaic covenant. This is the new covenant which the Lord make with the house of Israel after those days. The Lord will put and write his law within Israel and on their heart. Lord will be Israel's God, and Israel shall be his people. Israel will not all, know, all know the Lord, the least of them to the greatest of them. So what I'm thinking, all Israel will know the Lord from the least to the greatest. All Israel will receive the new covenant. All Israel will be saved, Romans chapter 11, verses 25, 26, down there. The Lord will forgive Israel's iniquity and sin and remember it no more. All those verses, the Lord will never cast off the offspring of Israel for what they have done. Never cast off the offspring of Israel for what they've done, but they sure deserve it. I think they deserve it for what they did to Christ. But what I think doesn't really matter. It's what it says, right? It's what it says. <clears throat> The Middle Kingdom will be a time of peace, time of joy, time of comfort. Many, many, many other passages explain the Middle Kingdom like that. And then there's a picture of Ezekiel's temple. Exact dimensions of every room and the purpose of every room is in the book of Ezekiel. Last page. <clears throat> yeah. They're specifically not mentioned as that small group. But <clears throat> in the Old Testament, David and 
Job and different people talk about, don't send me down to Sheol, Lord. I don't want to go to Sheol, which is kind of another word for Hades, which I think is a holding place for unbelievers until the time of judgment. So I would say they are probably in Hades, okay? So what gets kind of confusing because you're going to say, well, let me see, Hades, is that the same as the abyss or something? But I think there's that temporary holding place for those unbelievers because if, like we are today, if we die, our spirits go to be with our Lord and our bodies to the grave where unbelievers, their spirits don't go to be with the Lord. So they have to be somewhere because even unbeliever spirits are eternal like believer spirits are eternal so your spirit never goes away and even says twice once in Zechariah I think chapter 12 that God forms the spirit within you and I think it says that in Ezekiel and Ecclesiastes too I think. so my answer is that they're probably more than likely in Hades, or if you want to call it Shoal, temporary holding place. Because as we'll see in the next couple of verses, you have the great white throne judgment, and all the dead are resurrected. And then it says, all of those out of Hades, <laughs> death and Hades, and the sea, and it mentions the sea, the ocean, are all brought before the Lord, judged for their deeds, thinking, why would they say deeds? But what's interesting about that, when we get to that next week, all are sent to the lake of fire. You think, oh, they're judged for the deeds, so, you know, maybe 10% or something would come out good in the end. But you don't want to be judged for your deeds, of course. Salvation. Anyway, hope that helps. Leno Kingdom... <clears throat> I don't know if I have time to read this whole thing because we're already over time. So you can read this on your own, Isaiah 65. But one thing, notice as you read through those verses, look over to the right what I put in parentheses. And I'm going to read some of those real quick. They forget the past earth. They rejoice in gladness. No crying in Jerusalem. They will live long. They will live long. They will live long. They will live in houses. They will work and eat. They will benefit from their labor. Oh, they're going to labor. They're going to work. They will live long. They will work. They will work. They will bear children. They will have offspring. They will have descendants. The Lord will answer prayer. Animals at peace, vegetarians. Animals, vegetarians, meaning animals don't eat meat. Serpent still cursed. No evil or harm in Jerusalem. Hmm. Satan still exists, but of course he's in the abyss that we just read. Present kingdom age and lineal kingdom age are about the 2,000 years. And so I basically just go through there and just highlight some of the key things to remember about the millennial kingdom. Okay? So because of time, I won't go through all of those. I'll let you read through those. Some of those are kind of repeated. So my main emphasis of this class was to tell you that there actually is going to be a thousand year millennial kingdom with Christ reigning on the throne on Mount Zion that will be raised up and there'll be a plane around it somehow. The millennial kingdom will be a remodeling of the earth, but not a new earth. You see the difference there? It's the old earth remodeled to accommodate all the things done. And then what we'll be reading in the next couple of verses is it says, and the earth fled away. A couple of verses later it says, and then there was a new earth, right? So all of these things, which some of I repeated three or four times, are the main events in the millennial kingdom and what it'll be like. But there's parts of Isaiah that just go on and on and going, well, you know, it'll be kind of like this and kind of like that and sort of like this, and then these people will do that and all that. So keeping track of all those people groups and how it's going to be, so we can talk about some more of that later, but there will definitely be 
people that don't believe in the millennial kingdom. I don't really like that idea, but that's what it says. I want everybody to believe. I'm thinking, oh, another point I want to bring up is, hopefully I can say it in just a minute here, <clears throat> that don't you think it's interesting in the book of, of I mean, in, in the Bible, that even when God is in the presence of Israel in the tabernacle, traveling with them for 40 years, actual God Almighty comes out of the pillar cloud into the tabernacle with them. They're like, eh, I don't know if I'll believe. And they don't, right? And then in the Gospels, God in the flesh comes, does all these things, and Jason talks about it a little bit this morning, about the signs and wonders, and he says he's God. He does things only God can do. He forgives sins that only God can do. They don't believe. Hmm. Jesus reigning on the throne in the lineal kingdom, in, on, on the mountain. Perfect fairness, judgment during the millennial kingdom with Christ himself on the throne and all of these, the 12 disciples and the David and all the believers, people still don't believe. What does that tell you about salvation? I'm not going to tell you the answer, but it's a good thing to think about. <laughs> you see what, but you see what I'm saying? You have this much evidence, and you still don't come to Christ. You have God standing in front of you, and it's like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'll believe you or not. The Pharisees, remember, the main reason they wanted to crucify Jesus, he claimed equality with God. Anyway. I just think it's a really interesting point. It teaches us about salvation. I'll stop here. <clears throat> Father, this is such a key part of scripture of how, you, how your kingdom is pulled together in the end times, this thousand year kingdom that you mentioned six times in Revelation 20, that you revealed to John so that John could reveal to us. Help us not be confused by theories and ideas for our imagination, but only trust in what it says and what it means by what it says. Okay? Help us do that, Lord. Help us understand the right way. Not necessarily my way, but the right way. The right way that the text actually says, literally. Lord, I thank you for this time that we can discuss some of these things in detail and maybe give some people a better insight of what it's going to be like in the future kingdom. And uh, like we say in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, speaking of your millennial kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>